morning, Tuck of Siege. Man, my name is Jason Marler, and we are privileged to have you with us here today. Stephen had made note, in case you didn't know, you know, Kyle was out today. Chris isn't here. A lot of people on this is, you know, that time of year, Memorial Day. A lot of people are at the beach, and you're probably like me. You didn't have the PTO, so that's why. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But I was thinking about this morning as, as I was rolling in, I, I drive through, um, as many of you know, if you've been here for any amount of time, I have to drive down 27 to get here because I haven't found a way to teleport. But I was coming down through there and, and coming past Hillcrest, the, the cemetery, there, the big cemetery, and the veterans of foreign wars, these older men and women that were out there putting the flags out at six, like 7 o'clock this morning. And, and I thought about that, and I thought about, you know, what we have and, and where we are and, and what that means. And for us, you know, it's not something that we just get up here and just have a whole Memorial Day service, but because I don't think that's why they died for that, was that so we could come here and hear the gospel. And so we're going to double down on that for us. But at the same time, I don't want us to forget why it is, if you will, that you get to enjoy this long weekend and so as you enjoy this long weekend, we remember those men and women, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, friends and family who are not able to enjoy it. So if you will, let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, as we begin this service, I pray, Lord, for your blessings on those who have given their service, Lord, to this country, for all that they have done. Lord, we are thankful and grateful that there is nothing good in us, but that we are blessed to be in this country and for those who fight for our right to be here today. And God, I pray that we would honor their memory by living out the truths that they died for, that they fought for, and that we would honor you in all that we do. And we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise in Christ's name. Amen. So if this is your first time with us or first time back in a while, we're walking through the book of John. We started this during the main part of the Rona we were going through, and we were like really walking through a book of the Bible. And we spent that time walking through the book of Philippians. And I was just reading through, and I told leadership, and I was talking with Shuford, and I was like, man, I, so I really want to walk through the book of John. And if I had to do it over again, I'd be like, we need to walk through 1 John, because it's like three chapters, right? Like, the book of John is one of the longest gospels. It's 21 chapters, and, and we're on chapter 4, and we've been here for a while. And, and, but I, I tell people, and, and part of that is to understand this, that one of the big things that we wanted to double down coming out of everything that we did, and, and believe it or not, we're getting ready this time next Sunday. So next Sunday is what, the 6th, right? That is one full year that we've been back open and going to church. And that's a testament to your leadership and your staff here and, and the volunteers and all the stuff that they did to keep all those different things going. I know some of you are just now coming back, but we have had our doors open and going strong for a whole full year. And, 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 and I, God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be open every year from here on out, never again, Right. But it's really cool as I, as I think about that. But when we were in that time, it was like a really understanding this idea of are we making disciples? Because you can, you can grow a church with a crowd, right? But disciples are made. We don't want to build our church on the bones of the unredeemed, if you will. We want to make sure that we were digging deeper into God's word and as a church that we could do these things. And part of that was that we're going to spend time walking through books of the Bible and, and having these conversations. You know, if you've been here way back when, it was, you know, mostly we were topical and we hit on these little things and, and, and those were always cool and they were always right on time. And I think they were, they were God inspired and, and, and given at those times. But at the same time, when you read through just the whole manuscript of scripture, the whole totality of scripture, it hits exactly where you are every time. And it has amazed me to no end, All right? It shouldn't that God works that way, but it's always awesome to see that. But another part of this is so that this isn't the only Jesus, the only Bible that you get. Because here's, here's, here's the secret. I'm going to let you in on this, all right? Next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching in John. Two Sundays from now, I'm going to be preaching in John, right? Christmas time, we're probably going to still be in John. Well, I say all that not to, not to dissuade you, right, but to encourage you that you can be reading in the Scriptures yourself and you come in here ready, Right? There's six days between now and next Sunday, and it's up to us to prepare our hearts for that and to be in here. And when I start talking about something, you're like, ah, God's already showed me that, right? Or you missed this, Patriot. This is when we have these conversations. It's important and essential, right, that you have your quiet time. I, I'm all for your devotionals and all that time, too. But if this, if God's Word is not part of that, if it's not the foundation of those things, then you're, then you're doing it wrong. If this is the only time that you crack open your Bible app or your Bible, and this time you're, you're missing it. You're not hitting it all, right? You're 
You're, you're, in the, you're in the Lamborghini and you're stuck in second gear. There's so much more for us. And that's what we want you to see as we go through that, right? That's what we want you to see as we, as we walk through this. Now, we've been in chapter four for a little while here because it's the story of the woman at the well. Again, this is probably familiar to you if you, if you grew up in church, you, you know, Sunday school and those things, the woman at the well. And we've been walking through this, but it's a really pretty cool time to kind of sit and unpack all this. The, the big story we've been talking about is we, we start to see the context of there. And we understand right, that there's a big divide between the Jews and the Samaritans and that this is a big deal for Jesus to go there. It was a big deal for any Jew to go into Samaria. They would, they would avoid it. Remember, if you remember my imaginary map, don't, don't get all fancy with Chris Shuford's fancy map they had up on the screen last week. See, I trust that y'all are smart enough with imaginations that you can imagine. Like He looks down on you. I don't. He's probably watching this right now. But right, but remember, you, like you would walk all the way around. So we started to get all of this, that they under, start to understand. Here's the great thing about this story. God used an unlikely woman to reach an unlikely people. And he does the same thing with us. He used this person, this woman. This was the, the, an outcast among outcasts, right? Looked down upon. And this was the, the tool that he used to reach this whole community. You see, God had a people in Samaria, and he was going to reach them, and nothing was going to stop that. You, the whole story of the story of the woman at the well is a story about evangelism, of taking the gospel out, of fulfilling that purpose and that call that we all have of the Great Commission, of living that out. And so the story kind of concludes at the end here. Last week, Chris talked about it. We, we saw the lady who, who came to faith, and she drops her bucket, and she runs into town, and she goes and gets everybody. And she's like, hey, you got to come see this man who knows everything that I did. And then in a few verses later, we see that the townspeople come out, and they come out, and then they come out because she called them, but then they believe because they see. But in the middle of this, sandwiched in between this, this wonderful recounting of this community coming to Christ— God, Jesus has this deeper spiritual kind of dialogue with his disciples. So sandwiched in between this story of the lady dropping her bucket and, and going out to the town and people coming back and then everybody coming out and, and seeing Jesus, we have a conversation that John records for us with the disciples and Jesus. And Jesus is going to explain to them, he's going to go a little bit deeper and tell them what they're seeing and explain what it means, not just for them then, but for us now. So we are in John, if you haven't picked that up yet, John chapter 4, it's the fourth of the Gospels, so the New Testament's the fourth book there. We have Bibles there for you in your, in your pew for those. If you have the Bible app, I always tell you, version is a great app to have because you can find that version that, that kind of reads to you in a way that you can read and understand it. And, a, and kind of a side thing to that that's always pretty cool is that we put our sermon notes out there every Monday, so you'll be able to see those um, on Mondays when you can go out on version and see that. So wherever and however you're following along in your scriptures, if you will, let's stand up for the reading of God's word. So John chapter 4, and we're going to be in verses 31 to 42. And I told him in our first service, like, I'm at that age, and this is terrible that I have to admit this to you guys, but we're all family in here. This is a circle of trust. That, what do you call it? Not bifocals, what do you call it, honey? Progressive lenses. Like, right now, I can see that, and then I look down, I can't. So when you start seeing me take my glasses off, like the old school teacher, I'm not trying to be cool. I really can't see anymore, and it's just, this is it. This is, this is the life that I am. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. All right, here we go. John chapter 4, verses 31 to 42. So the, the disciples kind of give you the context. So the disciples have come back. They're coming up and seeing Jesus talking to the woman. The lady drops her bucket and, and runs off and says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, as someone brought him something to eat, and Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say they are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Now many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony of, he told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. 
And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, my my prayer is the same as John. When he would write in John 20, 31, that they would believe that you, Christ, are the Son of God, the Chosen One, that by believing in your name, they may have eternal life. I pray that you would open our eyes to that today, Holy Spirit. Our eyes and our ears that we would see and that we would hear and pierce our hearts that we would receive and come to know Jesus as the Savior of the world and more importantly, as the Savior of our souls. And it's in his holy and precious name that we pray. Amen and amen. All right, Simon says you may be seated. So when we start kind of bouncing through just kind of that big picture overlook to this, like I said, we see the big picture there. So Jesus has come into Samaria. He has come into a people that were rejected and denied, this group of outcasts. And in this group of outcasts, he has come to the outcast of outcasts. He said, and early on in the story, John said that Jesus said, I had to. He said, Jesus had to go through Samaria. And he comes there, and he has this conversation with the lady at the well. And she comes to faith, leaving all that she has behind and running to go and tell. And in the middle of this, the disciples come up, and they see him talking to the woman. And, and they're kind of like questioning themselves because they know that's not right. But the, the thing here, when we see the, the, the disciples' conversation, it adds weight to the context that we've been talking about. This is not supposed to be happening. All right, this is, a, this is an unusual thing that's going on. This is not the way stuff happens. This is not the status quo. Jesus is working outside of the cultural norms. He's working outside of the system of how things are supposed to do because he had to be there to meet with this woman, that this woman would take that, know, that knowledge and that meeting into the town. And so they come up to him and they're kind of like, hey, um, you need to eat because we went and got the food and, and you, you don't have anything to eat. And, and one of the most important verses in, in this whole section for us is when Jesus says, I have food that you don't know what it's about. For my food, my bread, is to do the will of him who sent me. And, and we talked about this idea of bread in this culture, in, in the Jewish culture, and man, in my life today, right? Bread is essential, Right? I know people all the time like, you know, you got to go on that carb-free diet and keto and all that stuff. No, God made bread and he told me to eat and not call unclean what he has called clean. So I'm going to be fat and happy. I don't care, right? Because bread is important. It is essential. When this phraseology here, this phrase is used, right? I have bread, right? This is my bread to do. He's saying this is my everything. This is essential to my life. This is as, as much as water, bread, air. What my life is all about is to do the will of of him who sent me. That's, that's preeminent in anything that I do before I eat, before I drink, before anything else is, am I in, am I doing God's will? And I got to tell you, as a pastor, one of the biggest questions that I get all the time, and especially even now, like they're, you know, it's graduation time and, and everybody's trying to figure out what they're going to do and different things is, it's like, hey, Jason, what do you think God's will for me is? Is it this college or is it that college? I have, is it, is it, is it, should I marry this person? or what, Where's God's will at in my life? And, and I think a lot of that's kind of our fault because we, we put all this, this emphasis on God's will without explaining how do you know it and how do you walk in it and how do you see it. You know, we have this in our mind that God's will is this teeny tiny bullseye, right? This right in the center of this and, and I got to hit it exactly right or I've just messed up my whole entire life. Let me give you a little bit of freedom to screw up here. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Jesus way. Romans 8, 28 covers all of that, right? That God works through all things to the benefit of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That God is always working out our good in his glory, and our good is always found in his glory. That's foundational to everything else, and that frees you up when you make decisions that you can do that and make mistakes, okay? But when we're talking about this idea of, of God's will, Jesus is talking about, hey, this is my purpose, on earth, this is what I am here to do, is what God sent me for. That is a laser focus in my life. And so how do we begin to recognize that in our own lives? And so to be kind of start with the negative side of that, instead of where we sit at, is what keeps us from seeing it to begin with? Like, what is our barriers that we have in, in our own life? When we talk about this idea, and I kind of came up with this, this thought, and I didn't come up with this. Man, it sounded like I came up with All right, don't be, like, atting me later. Like, you didn't come up with that. I read, 
Spiritual blindness. All right? I didn't invent the term, but this is where I was at when I was trying to figure out what keeps us from determining God's will in our life and being able to see that and to see what it is that he is doing. It is this idea and this thought of spiritual blindness. That it causes us to miss God's will for our lives, to miss that purpose. We don't see those things. Now, the first one is kind of an obvious one, but not so obvious. Sometimes the obvious one is the thing that we miss the most. Sometimes we don't see God's wills because we and of ourselves are not part of his family, right? Sometimes we are spiritually blind because we're still dead in our sin, unbelieving and requiring new birth, right? This is the unrepentive, still in the flesh, unredeemed person. This is who I was before Christ. But we're walking around unredeemed in our sins, still trying to figure out where God's will is for our life. And you're never going to be able to see that because you're still spiritually blind. The Bible talks about it in this way, that the prince of this world, right, the devil, like blinds us to be able to see what God is doing and where God is moving. We are in, incapable of recognizing those things because we don't see with those eyes. We don't recognize when those eyes. Jesus, when he was talking to, to Nicodemus, said, right, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. He's like, you can't hear these things because they're spiritual things. Right off the bat, when I say spiritual sight, right, when we talk about this idea of spiritual blindness, then we're talking about spiritual things, right, a redeemed life. And sometimes we don't see those things and it's, it's the Bible talks about when you have that moment of conversion that it's almost like scales come and you can see. It changes the context and the perception of, of how you see things. And, and you, you've recognized this even in your, in your own life, in your conversations with others, whether or not you recognize it as such at the time. Uh, case in point, how many times have, have something happened to you and you see it as God's blessing, but somebody who is, is not a Christian, they don't see it as God's blessing. They see it as, man, that's just lucky. How'd you get, man, you get all the breaks. And one of my, my favorite stories is, is, is one of our folks here at Tuck and Siege years ago was talking about like going to the, to the pool. And she said, like, we just had just enough money for you know, my, me and my kid to go to the pool and get in. We, we couldn't even take snacks or anything like that. And uh, she said, we, so we go to the pool and we're just hanging out there. And all of a sudden at the pool, they're like, hey, it's trivia day. And we're going to do 60s music, classic rock music. And, and she was like, she said, I started paying attention. She said, because I used to be a DJ at a classic rock station. He said, next thing you know, they said, all right, we're going to do this stuff, and you can win snacks and food from the concession stand. She said, Jason, I answered every single question. She said, we won so much food that I was giving it away. And she said, I'm going to tell you something. She said, a year ago, I would have thought how lucky that was for us. She said, but today I knew that was God's blessings. You see, it's the ability to recognize that. You track with that, right? There's a spiritual blindness. You can't see what God's doing because you're not there. As a matter of fact, what, what really happens when you see that stuff happening in other people's life, and here's a little litmus test for you, if you see that stuff happen in other people's lives and you don't have the ability to recognize it, you're going to grow bitter about that in their life, and you're not going to celebrate what God's doing in their life. You're going to tear them down, right? You're going to find reasons of why it's them and not you, excuses. So that is that spiritual blindness that comes because we don't have, we're not ourselves spiritually inclined because we don't have the Spirit that was Jesus' whole point in Nicodemus. You can't understand what I'm saying. The first five chapters, four chapters of, of John, Jesus has dealt with spiritual blindness, right? Right off the bat when he was talking to the Jews about the temple, and he was like, hey, you tear this temple down, in three days it'll be rebuilt. And they were, didn't understand what he was saying. Right? He was talking about his body. He was talking about the way that he was going to be resurrected, but they didn't see that because they saw with physical, not spiritual eyes. And they were like, how are you going to rebuild this temple in three days? It took 42 years. We see it with Nicodemus, the same thing. He told him, he said, hey, unless you're born again, you can't see these things. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again? And he's going to climb back into his mother's womb. And all the moms said, no, that's not working. Right? Physical eyes, not spiritual eyes. We, we saw it with here when we see the woman at the well. And Jesus says, hey, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would have asked him for living water. And he would have gave you the water that never runs out. And she's like, how are you going to do that? You have a bucket. And here he is with the disciples, these who have been around him the longest, who have watched him do miracle after miracle, and they still are missing it. But, but why are they missing it too? Like, how can we, like, if, if we know at one time we could see, but now we can't see as well, what is that? And so the first reason we miss spiritual blindness is because we and of ourselves are not spiritual. 
But the second reason can be because even in our spiritual lives, we can become complacent with our sin. Right? Because of the complacency with sin in our own lives. Let me, let me lay it down like this so I think you can pick what I'm saying. Like, you don't accidentally and or overnight begin to have clogged arteries. Right? That doesn't just happen like overnight. Like, you don't just go into the doctor like one year for your physical and the next year they're like, I don't know what happened. Every, you got a 95% blockage. That happens over time. Right? You have to make changes in the intermittent things. All these little intermittent things leave up to that. Maybe, maybe that's too much for you because you're all healthy, so you, you, don't, you don't track with that. How many of you have water spots on your shower? You know what I'm talking about? Like the glass shower thing, right? We, man, we, have, we live out in the country, so we got the well water. And I guess it's it hard, soft, whatever it is that puts the spots on there. And, and just over time, living in the house, it was like one day it was clear glass, and then the next time I looked up, and it's like, did we get frosted glass? Is, did we change this out? And it doesn't matter. I mean, I took 2,000 grit wet sandpaper and was trying to wet sand and buff that stuff out. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't go away. It doesn't come off easy, right? Flash, fast forward a little bit. We got an all new bathroom with new glass now. And you know what we have in there right now to make sure that doesn't happen again? We got a squeegee. How many of you squeegee your shower? We're my, we're my type A people. I'm not type A, but then squeegee is fun. <laughs> but if this preaching thing don't work out, I will be a window washer, man. I got that down. But why am I doing that, right? Daily, I am in there after we get out. That's the rule. You use our shower now, you squeegee. Why? Because I don't want water spots again in my life. Why are we walking through John together? Why am I telling you it's so important that you stay in God's word, that you're praying, and that you're walking this walk? Because I don't want it to build up. Why? Because when it does get there, it's going to be hard to get it back off and get it back on again. It's easier to fix it now than it is to fix it later, right? What is that in ounce of prevention and a pound of cure. Did I get that right? I think so. Wow, that didn't happen that often. But we become complacent, and, and, and complacency leads to apathy and indifference, and, and we miss it, and then we wonder why we don't see God working anymore. Listen, when you are in that place of, of praying and staying in God's Word and walking with Him in a relationship with Him, it changes how you see everything. Man, it, it, it changes when people cut you off and pull out in front of you. You're like, well, God, I guess you've got something for me to do right here, right? And again, Progress over perfection. Y'all know God's working on me with that, right? But as you start to see it, it changes how you see that stuff. And it changes your, your approach. It changes how people see you. It changes how you see people. A, week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I'm on a board of directors at, at, our, at our school. And we said, hey, let's have a prayer walk after our meeting. So it's like 9.15 at night. And we're walking around the school. And it's, it's dark. And everybody's kind of going their different ways. But it was so cool because as we, everybody was praying and we're going on a different thing, and we got back together, everybody's faces had changed, right? Nobody wants to be at a board meeting at 9 o'clock at night, let alone walking around in the darkness. But because we were praying, because we were just praying and thanking God for stuff that he had done at our school and places that he was, he was moving, we got there, and by the time we all got back together in a group, everybody was just praising God. Like, it went from just praying for the school to just, man, God is just awesome. Look at what he's blessed us with. And, and everybody's just singing that. And what happened there is they had that vision to see even the smallest thing, God at work and what God was doing. And here's the biggest thing about that is other people see it too. When we talk about this idea of God's will for you, I mean, I could essentially just go up here and tell you, go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. It says, be joyful always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. And, and I read those three verses and I equate them right over to 1 Peter 3.15 that says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. You see, when you're praying continuously, or you're joyful always, praying continuously and giving thanks in every circumstance and living that out, people are going to notice that. They're going to see. You can tell, right, when somebody at your office, when you walk into the cubicles and all that, you're going to the, to the coffee, you can tell who's had a good day. I can tell who's had a good morning coming to church just watching y'all walk in. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't change after God gets to working on you, but I can tell, right? We all try to walk in and fake it, but you'd be like, nah, I know. Y'all been beating your dog this morning. Y your kids didn't get their clothes on. They really got dismatting. You just, you just threw them in the car. Your toast was burned. You got behind that. Slow car on 27, right? It, it shows. But in the same way, right, the joy that we have. And so when you're able to look past all that and that spiritual 
the spiritual eyes, the, the, the see God working and to see things as God sees it, right? What happens then is bigger than that. What the disciples needed and what we need too was that vision for the harvest, right? The vision for the harvest. When you're in that mode, when you have, you're reading and you're just, you're praying and you're just in tune with God and you just, you have that, that line of communication open, you're able to see stuff as, as he does. And so the vision for the harvest for us, that means that we look out and we see what God is doing and where he is already moving and we join with him, right? We join up with God where he is already doing stuff, what he is already doing. He is already moving out there and doing things. This is what Jesus was talking about to the disciples. He's like, hey, you're getting ready to reap things that you didn't even labor for. Like, when y'all was going to get dinner, I've been talking with this young lady, and this young lady has went and sowed these seeds in this community. The, the joy that she has of coming to know me, and all those people are coming out here, and they're running, and they're not running because you did anything. They're doing something because I was with her, and she went to them, and now they're coming to you. Now let's go reap. It's recognizing those moments. I, those are the God moments, right? Our, our, our kids downstairs, they call them God sightings. It's, it's being able to recognize where God is already working. It, it can be as small, guys, listen, it can be as small as that, that, little, that little pull you get on your heart to text that friend, to shoot them a message, to reach out to somebody, to just check in. It, it could be as small as, as that, that tug on your, on your mouth that goes into a smile when you pass that person in the grocery store or at the gas station. You don't know what that means. You don't know where God's already doing you're, you see and you, you're feeling, you're in tune and you're looking and watching to see what God is doing and where he is already working and we move that way, right? Trust me, if you have those eyes and you're seeing the harvest and you are recognizing what God is doing and you're recognizing where he's already moving, you're not going to be able to go, that's cool. All right, I'm going to go over here. No, you're going to be like, I want to be part of that. That's awesome. And we have this vision for the harvest. It also means that we begin to see the world with the eyes of Jesus, means we're seeing people as Jesus sees them. And see, that's, that's a big deal, a vision, right, for redemption. Seeing the world with the eyes of Jesus for us, that means that we see them as God sees us. Right? It, it changes how we approach other people. At, at Tucker Siege, we always say that we exist to demonstrate God's love in our actions. Right? We do that by loving God completely, ourselves correctly, and others compassionately. You see, it's that recognition of who God is, that rec recognizing how God loves us, that not only allows us, but compels us to love other people that way. Becomes a big thing. It's, it's axiomatic. You can't not do it. You see the world with the eyes of Jesus. It changes how you see people. You begin to see them not as enemies, but as children of God, people created in his image, people in need of help the same way you are. It's been around for a long time. It's not original to me by no means, but it's the saying of evangelism is simply this. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And, and that is what we're called to do. And is what we are called to be. So in this for us, when Jesus is talking to the disciples, he, he tells them, right? He says, my purpose is to do the will of the Father. Jesus' purpose is implicitly and explicitly says, is to do the will of the Father who sent me. John 6, 39 says, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. John 12 says, for I have spoken nothing out of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to do. It's the same thing for us. You see, Jesus' purpose was to do the will of the Father, and our purpose is to do the will of Jesus who sends us. Towards the end of his ministry, at the end of John, in John chapter 20, verse 21, which we should be by, I don't know, 2022, right? Jesus said, hey, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. We probably more famously have heard this same phrase in, in Matthew 28 when Jesus gave the great commission. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Luke would record it this way when Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. You see, when we talk about these things, when we talk about what we are called to do, a a spiritual sight, a a vision for the harvest, it it is what I believe the mission of this church is, which has been from the beginning since we've been here, to reach this community for Christ. And we do that by living out God's love and our actions. But essentially for us, it came down to the two non-negotiables of the Bible. All right, the great commandment and the great commission. Right, the great commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And the great commission was to go and tell about that great God. You see, the living out of the great commandment is the working out of the great commission. The greatest love that you can have for somebody is to tell them of the greatest love ever. That is the implementation of the great commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul is to go and to tell. Listen, we we like to share. God bless you. Some of you share way too much, but you like to share. When we find something we like, when we find something we don't like, we like to share. Social media has opened up a whole new platform that's based totally on you being able to share those things. And I would like to say, I long for the days that we go back to just sharing pictures of your kids and your food and maybe a cute cat or puppy video every once in a while, if I may ask for your social media feeds. But we like to share. I like to share. If we've actually had the greatest thing ever, a relationship with God, why would that not be preeminent in what we want to share? Look, you can't go and have a good cappuccino and not tell people about it. How can you have a real meeting with the creator of the universe that changes your heart and not want to go and share? And I think, as we said earlier, I think the problem in the church with us as a whole isn't an unwillingness to share but that we, church people, have overcomplicated that. Like I got, you know, I, I got a whole degree in evangelism and church planning. I got a master's work in evangelism and church planning. I can give you all the different theological reasons for evangelism, all these things, and give you all these different statistics and steps and all these things, but they're all worthless compared to what this one woman did who had a meeting with Jesus that changed her life. And she ran and told everybody. So if you get nothing else out of this lady's story, get this, that you have a story to tell. And that is what you're called to do. You're like, Jay, I don't know all the theological ins and outs. You don't have to know those things. Later on, we see it with her, but we see it too with the blind man when they're like, how did he do this? And he's like, man, I don't know. All I knew was I was blind and now I see. That is a story. When you have a blind man who no longer can see, I don't care how he got there. That's just, I'm done. I don't even know. How did you get here? I can't tell you the eschatological reasons for what's going to happen in the future and all these different ideas of theolog- theological implications of all these different things and the, the atonement and all these ideas. All I know is I was here and I was lost and now I'm here and now I'm found. All I know is I was here and I was blind and I'm here, and now I see. And it's just like that, that song that, that, that Stephen sang, right? It's just, I see the evidence all around me. And, and when you see it, it compels you. And I'm telling you now, if you're not compelled that way, then you need to look at those first two things and figure out why you don't see it. But let me encourage you with this. In, in Galatians 6 is kind of this idea of the law of the harvest, which really plays back into to where we are with, with our story today, this idea of, of reaping and sowing and sowing and reaping. But there's this, this idea at the end that, that Paul tells the church in Galatia about, and I think it's an important thing for all of us. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. See, maybe you're running and you're going and you're telling and, and, and nothing's happening from that. Maybe you've been praying for that loved one, for that that person that you know, that person at work, that person at school, that person at your job, wherever it is, and you're just like, man, I just if they could just see you, God, if they could just know you, and you're praying for them, I'm telling you right now, the Bible tells us, God encourages us, don't give up with that. Don't give up. Continue to pray for them. 
You, you see, what I'm reminded about from my own story is that nobody's ever too far away. Nobody's ever too far gone because I wasn't. And probably truthfully, you know the same thing's true about you because you weren't. So we continue to pray. We continue to work even though we don't see things. Why? Because even when we don't see it, he's working. Even when we don't feel it, he's working. Continue to pray for them. Continue to be the light. Continue to be the city on the hill. Continue to be the salt of the earth. Continue to be all the things that God calls you to be in that person's life and for that person. And it may be somebody you can't even like talk to, but you can pray for them. Do not give up on that. I think one of the, the greatest things that, that I saw in my own life was when I got to call my parents and I was calling my mom and I was talking about what happened to me and that little trailer in Callaway, right? It's like, I gave my heart. I accepted and recognized my own sin. And I turned all that over to Jesus. And the first thing they said is, we've been praying about this. Like, praying? How'd, how'd you even know? I thought I had everybody fooled. We, we've been praying for this. Don't, don't grow weary of doing good. Well, what if they don't reciprocate? Don't grow weary of doing good because in due season you will reap if you don't give up you know what my hope is is understanding that even if I don't see it that God's going to work and there may be fruit to labor that I've been doing for years that I'll never know about till I get to heaven and I'm okay with that let us stand and as we get ready to close out transition for us bridging this service to our time around the Lord's table with song and worship. I want to take time for just a moment, just reflecting back on on what you've heard today. Spiritual blindness that's in your life, is there spiritual blindness because you don't have eyes to see because you don't have a spirit, the spirit of God? Or, or, Or maybe like my old bathroom shower stall, right? It's got hard water on it, hard hearts, calcium deposits that have built up that need to be scrubbed and cleaned. Maybe, maybe you're that third that we read about in Galatians. You need to be encouraged not to grow weary, and to stay strong, to stay the course, to continue your labor, knowing that in due season you will reap a bountiful harvest. You see, the first one, that begins with having a relationship with God. It comes only from you being able to recognize that there's a problem in your life, which is sin. And being so overwhelmed and overcome with your sin, not because of the consequences of that, but because of the consequences to God. That against Him and Him alone have you sinned. Maybe the other side is just repenting of that sin that you've become complacent with and pushing it away. Just like the psalmist told us that we could have the joy of our salvation restored. Maybe it's just to be encouraged, to be joyful always, to pray continuously, to give thanks in every circumstance. Wherever and however you fall upon that spectrum today, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move and give you eyes to see that and ears to hear it. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. But more importantly, Father, I pray that we are overwhelmed and overcome by the love that you have for us. God, we say it every Sunday, and it almost becomes cliche, but cliches are cliche because there is a truth there. We are here on purpose and for a purpose. Whatever we thought that was when we came here today, I pray that we recognize that it was to hear what we need to be and what we need to see in you. God, I pray for all the people and wherever it is, whether it is in need of redemption and repentance, a restoration of a joy that was already there, or encouragement to continue the fight. God, whatever that looks like in their lives, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move as only you can, encouraging, exhorting, convicting, and convincing. All in Christ's name. Amen.